This is class five in Brother Simeon Guntrip's series of Angels, Ministers of God, and he's called it Angels and the Gospel. Brother Simeon. Wow, session five. It's good to be with you all again. And what we're going to be considering today is the angels again. So hopefully we're building up quite a reservoir now of how the angels have been at work under God, according to his commandments, from creation. We've seen angels amongst the nations. We've seen angels uh, working through Israel, keeping that way to the tree of life. Um, today we're going to think about the angels and the gospel. And what I mean by that is... I believe a correct understanding of how the angels work under God and the Lord Jesus Christ, as we saw, helps us with some of our first principles. So just to a tiny bit pick up where we were yesterday, I want you to come back with me um, to Genesis 22 again. You will have all heard about the promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and, and we saw how the angels were at work in all of their lives. But I just want to specifically highlight something here. Genesis 22 and verse 15. So God used the angel to communicate with Abraham, okay? Verse 15, and the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, so this is the angel speaking to Abraham, by myself I have sworn. So the angel is representing God, Yahweh, the Lord, clearly here. By myself I have sworn, saith Yahweh, saith the Lord. So that's interesting, isn't it? Verse 15, the angel of the Lord appeared and then says, by myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. So what we've got is God manifestation here. God is revealing himself through the angel. Now this comes up many times, but it's really important to try and grasp and understand. When God reveals himself through angels, we use the phrase God manifestation. It's, it's God is manifesting himself, he's revealing himself. So that has a, a point for us when we become a bit older and want to become baptized and become part of the family of God. God wants to reveal himself through us as well. So we can manifest God just like the angels manifest God. So read on and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in, and so we have the promises, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed, as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his. Why do you think that's singular? enemies. Singular, isn't it? What is the his referring to there? Shall possess the gate of his enemies. Any thoughts? Prophetically, who is this looking forward to? Any ideas? Ben? In what way? Okay. Yeah, so he did possess the gate of his enemies in that sense. Yeah. Further forward. Who's ultimately going to possess or has possessed the gate of his enemies? So it's talking about the seed going forward, the promise to Abraham that came through Isaac and Jacob and that the seed of the woman would possess the gate of his enemies. Verse 18, And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So there's something going on here in the end of verse 17 about a singular seed possess the gate of his enemies. All right? So first point, it was an angel that revealed this. God used the angel, 
All right? Second point, possess the gate of his singular seed. Come forward with me to Galatians, the book of Galatians. And if you haven't got this, you know, in your notes or in your margin, it's really worth putting it there. Galatians and chapter 3. And look at verse 8, because this is where it chimes in with what we're looking at today, this morning. Okay, verse 8, and the scripture foreseeing, and the scripture here would be the Old Testament scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, that's make righteous the heathen, through faith. Now, this is really important, preached before the gospel, the good news to Abraham. So, what we're being told here, the scripture is telling us that the gospel was preached to Abraham. Well, what was it that was preached to Abraham that is the gospel? Read on. Verse 8 again. Um, preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying, and this, this is the essence, this is the hub, this is the core of the gospel, in thee shall all nations be blessed through the promises that the angel gave to Abraham all the nations would be blessed so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham and it's the angel that revealed that to Abraham back in Genesis 22 now look a little bit further on in this same chapter so we've seen that the promises are in fact that the core, the hub, really, of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So look at verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, that's the preaching way back in Genesis, through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Brethren, he says... Um, I speak after the manner of men, though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Careful note, verse 16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one. And to thy seed, which is Christ. So there you have it. So when it talks about, way back in Genesis 22, he will possess the gate of his enemies, the his is referring, that, that's, that's singular, that is referring to Jesus Christ. The seed of Abraham, i.e. Jesus Christ, will possess the gate of his enemies. And the ultimate enemy, of course, was death, wasn't it? And Jesus was raised on the third day. Jesus has possessed the gate of his enemies. So can we see how the, the scriptures hang together? There's the angel giving the promises, the blessings there, way back to Abraham. Galatians 3 says those promises are really at the very center of the gospel. Now there's many Christians, so-called, around today in the world that call themselves Christians and say, nah, I don't need the Old Testament, you know, we'll just stick to the New Testament. Um, the Old Testament, you know, that's, that's gone. That's to do with Israel. We're, we're the people of God now. We don't need the Old Testament. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. The Old Testament underpins everything that's in the New Testament. The Old Testament looks forward to Jesus Christ in the promises, in the law, in the prophets. So never, ever, ever, ever think that we don't need the Old Testament. And I'm sure you don't think that anyway. But just be clear that a lot of so-called Christians say we don't need the Old Testament. Yes, we do. It's all part of God's inspired word. So, if the promises are the hub of the gospel then, and the gospel is the good news of things concerning Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God, what we see when we look at the angels, which is what we're going to do for our little time this morning, is how some of the first principal teachings and doctrines of the Bible, we can, we can help it be helped in our understanding of those 
if we understand the work of the angels. So, uh, the first one I just want to look at um, briefly is you've probably all heard of um, something, a doctrine, a teaching that most churches teach, and that's the Trinity. You've heard of that? Yeah, that there's three gods in one, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and people get muddled up in their thinking and try and say that it's in the Bible. Nowhere ever does the word Trinity come up in the Bible, and yet people say, oh yes, no, it's at the center of the Bible, the Trinity, etc. Again, it's just not there, and we could, we could spend easily all, all week just proving that it's not there. That's not our purpose. One thing I do want to do is demonstrate how a true and correct understanding of the angels help us in our understanding that there is one God and that Jesus Christ was his son and that his power is at work. His power through the angels is at work. Okay? So people incorrectly say that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. That's the wrong teaching. So what I want us to look at, you please, is look up these verses and see how God uses his Spirit. And I want you to just carefully, read carefully what it's actually saying. What or who is the Spirit on these occasions, please? So Psalm 104, it talks about in some way God's Spirit, but just read this way and that way, either side, I've given you the verses, just discover for yourselves who or what actually is the Spirit. Does it say it's the third part of the Trinity? No. What does it say? So five minutes. Um, I don't know if you can see them quite over there. Okay, if I put it at an angle. So compare Psalm 104 verse 4 with Hebrews 1 verse 7. Isaiah 63 verse 9 and 10, what does it say there? Acts 8 verse 26 compare with verse 29. And Acts 10, look at verse 3 and verse 19. Just do this little bit of Bible study yourself and see what... God is telling us that the Spirit is here. Or verse 4 and Hebrews 1 verse 7. What is it telling us? Someone please. What have we discovered from Psalm 104? What, in terms of the angels? Yeah, Jamie. Yeah, that's right. So made his angels, spirits. That's right. So the word spirit and the word spirits and angels are being linked together. God is, God is linking them together for us in his word. He's saying, yes, they are his spirits that do his will, that are flaming fire and go about doing his commandments. So we've got one linkage there. What do we learn, someone from this side, Isaiah 63 verse 9 and 10? What linkage do we find there in Isaiah 63 verse 9 and 10, someone? What was the connection? Anyone? Did you get anything being connected together there? No? Okay, let's look at it together then. If you come back to Isaiah 63. And verse 9. So in all their affliction he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. So we've got the angel there of his presence saved them. Okay, verse 10, but they rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. The angel was God's Holy Spirit amongst them as he led them through the wilderness. Okay, God's Spirit, God's ministering Spirit was there with them. The angel and God's Spirit are being brought together again there. 
So let's go to the New Testament, Acts chapter 8, and see what uh, parallels there are between spirits and angels there. So what did Samuel on this side find connecting between 26 and 29? Okay, yeah, Katie. Oh, okay, go. They what, sorry? Yes. Okay. So I think um, the flaming fire often is in the Bible used of judgment. Okay, so, you know, think back to Sodom and Gomorrah and things like that with, with God used fire to consume, didn't he? So God's angels, and we're coming to that in a moment, God's angels um, can well be used for judgment on people or judgment on nations. So they are termed a flaming fire on occasions. Not always, but on occasions. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Katie. Yeah, yep. Yeah, yeah. At the command of God, of course, very much so. Yes, yeah. I think in a lot of these things, you know, the, the scripture, and obviously rightly so, says, and the Lord did this and the Lord did that. What I'm trying to help us all understand is, yeah, the Lord did do it, Yahweh did do it, but through his angel. Yeah, they are his ministers, um, and there's thousands and thousands of them just doing God's will, as it were, and standing there, as we saw day one, I think, waiting for that command to say, right, go forth and do this, send fire down, yeah, which, which would be a good connection with the flaming fire. Great points, yep. So 26, 8 and 26, um, Someone from this side, can you tell me what the connection, what's going on here between 26 and 29, please? Anyone else other than Jim, Joseph? Okay, in which verse? Twenty-six, it's an angel talking to Philip. Great. Yep, and Yeah. What do we find in 29? Spirit. Yes. Yeah, 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, go near. So again, in one verse it says the angel is talking to Philip. In verse 29 it says the Spirit is talking to Philip. Angel and Spirit are linked together. God's ministering spirits working for his people. God is working through the angels again. Let's look at Acts 10, verse 3 and 19. What did we find there? So, verse 3 first. What do we read in verse 3 of Acts 10? Anyone going to help me out here? Verse 3 of Acts 10. So this was all about, um, yeah, a centurion. So verse 3, yeah, go. Great, thank you, yeah. So an angel came to Cornelius in the New Testament. Absolutely, great. And then we read on, um, verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, behold, three men seek thee. And we believe that that is the same. Look, verse 17, it's talking about while Peter doubted in himself what his vision uh, should mean, behold, the men which were sent from Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon's house and stood before the gate and called and asked whether Simon, which was surnamed Peter, was lodged there. While Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him, Behold, three men seek thee. I believe that's the angel. Again, Spirit and angel. God is teaching us that these are God's ministering spirits working in his purpose. Okay, so what's my point here? You know, a false understanding of the Bible, people say, 
God's Spirit is the third person of the Trinity? No. God's Spirit is working through his angels all the time. It's not a third person of the Trinity. It doesn't say that anywhere, okay? God's Spirit is working through the angels, and so much so that sometimes the angels are called God's Spirit, which is what we've just seen, okay? Whether it be through creation, through people's lives, in the days of Hezekiah, Israel, we saw that yesterday, didn't we? They're there, keeping the way. God's ministering spirits, keeping the way of the tree of life. Okay? And some people say, well, it's the spirit that makes me do good things. <laughs> you know? Uh, no, it's not, actually. It's God's word, hopefully, that we read, think about with the brains that God has given us, and then we translate that into doing good things from his word. Okay? Some people think, you know, that, that the Spirit of God, as it were, zaps us to make us do a good thing. That's the good influence in our life. Wrong. God doesn't work like that. He wants us to read his word, to learn of him, and to want ourselves to try and do the good thing. And we fail sometimes. We slip up. But God is a forgiving God. We pray to him for forgiveness, and he does. And we pick ourselves up again, and we have another go, and another go. But it's through God's word, God's spirit word that he wants us to move forward. So never, ever, ever, you know, underestimate the power of God's word in your life. Now, just as there is, the, you know, um, this, sadly, and we're talking about first principles today, that's why I'm talking a lot about this, and the gospel, all right, and teachings and doctrines and things. Sadly, just like false teaching and the false churches say there's this Holy Spirit, as it were, the third person of the Trinity. They also, on the other hand, say, well, actually, there's something that makes us do bad things as well called Satan. So really, we're stuck in the middle. Hang on, the Spirit makes me do good things. Satan makes me do bad things. I don't have any responsibility at all, do I? Rubbish. We have responsibility to read God's Word, and we can choose to do good or bad. Every one of you young people here can choose. Every one of you can choose. Am I going to do something good or am I going to do something bad? Am I going to obey my parents or am I not going to obey my parents, supposing they're asking you to do good stuff? Am I going to obey God more seriously or am I not going to obey? That is your decision. We as parents try to bring you up to help you make the right decision. So what about this side then, the bad decisions? Um, or bad things. What I'd like you to do, same exercise, but from, as it were, the opposite point of view, just note the references down, look through them, and just see what the connection is yourself. I want you to see from the Bible, yourselves, what connection is being made. Who is actually being an adversary here? Who actually, in, in some of these, is being Satan? Right? That people say is some, you know, equal and opposite God with the three-pronged thing and a tail and all this sort of superstition and Greek mythology, rubbish. Bad thoughts and evil thoughts come out of our own heart, Jesus says. Okay, but look at these verses and see who or what the adversary actually is. Let's just do this tiny bit of Bible study again together. So, 2 Samuel 24, 1, compare it with 1 Chronicles 21, 1. See what's happening there. See what we're being taught by the Bible. Then Numbers 22, verse 22 and 23. Psalm 78, verse 49. And Isaiah 45, verse 7. See where evil actually does come from. Is it from Satan, this, this so-called equal and opposite being? Right, five minutes on this, and then we'll get our thoughts together. So let's, uh, let's just look at these together then. 2 Samuel 24 verse 1 and 1 Chronicles 21 verse 1, they're parallel accounts of the same event in David's life. What do you notice in the very first verse? 
of each of those count, uh, accounts. Verse 1, there's, there's a, an interesting difference or contrast. What do you notice about it? One says one thing and the other says the other. Yes, please. Yes, exactly. So one says this is Yahweh, quite possibly revealed through an angel, because actually we read of an angel later in the chapter who brought the plague um, all around the issue of the numbering at that time. So one says Yahweh here, and the other says Satan. So what are we to understand from that? That actually God was acting as an adversary, as, incidentally, what does the word Satan mean in the Hebrew? Does anyone know? Yeah. Spot on. Exactly that. That's all it means. Now, what the translators have done, unfortunately, is um, when they've translated into English, they've used a capital S, which is wrong. There are no capitals in Hebrew, okay? No capitals. So they've made it look like a name. So in our Bibles, or at least in mine, Satan, when you read it, has a capital S. It shouldn't have a capital S. All it means is adversary. That's all the Hebrew word means. They pronounce it Satan, okay? Just means adversary. So what we learn from 2 Samuel 24 is that actually God was being an adversary. You know, it's not, not some, as I say, you know, evil being that somehow fell from heaven that's being an adversary. Actually, God was being an adversary to David. That doesn't mean God's wrong or whatever. God is testing David. He's being an adversary. He's opposing David at this point in time because that's what David needed. Okay? And it's a really good... Some of these references, my dear young people... I'll try and remember them because they might help you in your discussions at college, at university, at work, where you will come across people who will believe the sort of things that I'm saying. So when you get that, when someone says, oh no, Satan is um, you know, some uh, evil being that, that fell from heaven and, and, and such like, take them to these two references. Actually say, well, um, you say that. Well, look, I've got my Bible on me. I'll just get it out of my backpack or whatever. Um, look at these two references. Look, Satan is the Lord. How do you explain that then? Uh, uh. <laughs> yeah? See what they say. Okay. So the next one. Numbers 22, verse 22, 23. What's happening there? Please. Someone. What's going on in Numbers? This is the, the occasion of Balaam and the ass that spoke, isn't it? What do the scriptures tell us here, though? about uh, what's going on. Okay, Numbers 22, verse 22 and 3. Yes, please then, thank you. Right, okay, thank you. Yeah, so there was the adversary... Um, which is Satan. That is the word Satan in the Hebrew. The angel was an adversary. Okay? We don't need, <laughs> as it were, um, uh, such, some equal and opposite supposed evil being. God says, no, I am in control here. And at this point in time with Balaam, I need an angel to be an adversary to him. And you can see the angels discussing it. Okay. I'll be that adversary on this occasion. God sent an angel to help Balaam learn. Sadly, Balaam didn't learn very much on this occasion. But my point, my dear young people, is it was the angel that was the adversary. It was the angel that is, in the Hebrew, Satan, Satan. So we don't need to go anywhere outside and, and get these false ideas and false doctrines. It's all under, just read Scripture carefully. Um, now, let's just, what was the next one? Psalm 78, that's a fairly straightforward one, wasn't it? Psalm 78, 49. What does it actually tell us there? What can angels be? What's that, what's that descriptive word? Angels can be what? 
Psalm 78, verse 49. Ben, please. Yeah, evil. Now you might think, hang on, what? Angels being evil? Well, it's not because they're evil in the sense that, you know, disobeying God, but they are doing things which may be perceived by men and women. I don't like that very much. That's, that's evil to them. But God's at work. He uses an angel to do, as we might see it, evil things. Not evil as God sees it. It's part of his purpose. So angels can be evil, okay? We don't need some external, you know, thing to be evil and do evil things. So final one, Isaiah 45 verse 7, what does that tell us? Which confirms what we're saying, really. Yes, please, Katie. God does all things and even creates what? It says, have you got it open there? Does it just go on to say something else there? Does it say something like, I create? Oh, you've got disaster, okay. So in my version it says evil. I create evil. So, just recap what am I saying? God uses his angels. Sometimes they're called spirits. Okay. God uses his angels. Sometimes they're called Satan. But it's all to do with God's work. The angels. And this is how they... A true, a proper understanding of angels in the Bible can just help us see how God works and how actually it diffuses any idea of, you know, a third person of the Trinity called the Spirit or of some evil being called the Satan. We just don't need those. It's not part of Scripture. So thanks for your work on that. What I'm going to do now is just quickly go through, and I want you to come through the references with me, just to show some other um, first principles where the angels are at work, and then we're going to need to round off and close. Okay, so um, come, let's look at uh, Luke 1 to start with. So angels were at the birth of Jesus Christ. Luke 1. And here in the context of John, initially. So I'm going to do a bit of a rapid fire for the last 10 minutes, okay? So take notes or whatever. Make marginal notes or take notes in a notebook. Um, just need to get through probably around half a dozen areas where angels are involved in first principles as revealed. So the birth of Jesus, verse 11 of, of Luke 1, there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Okay, and verse 13, the angel said unto him, fear not, Zacharias. Look at verse 18, Zacharias said unto the angel, whereby shall I know this uh, about the birth of John? Come over to Luke 2 and verse 9. Uh, now this is the birth of Jesus Christ. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round upon them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. Interesting that, isn't it? Often when we find angels in the Bible, it says, Fear not. I think that we might need that message if we suddenly saw an angel. Fear not, for behold, I bring good tidings. That's the gospel, good news of great joy, which shall be to all people. And so it's the angel that brings the announcement of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, come over to Luke chapter 12 while we're in Luke. We see angels involved in the judgment of God. Luke 12, verse 8 and 9. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. That's interesting, isn't it? So the angels of God are involved at some level in the judgment. Come over to Matthew 13 and verse 49. 
We're going to come back to Luke, so if you want to leave a marker there for the moment. Matthew 13, verse 49. Here's the angels involved the judgment at the end of the world. Verse 49, so shall it be at the end of the world, the angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just. God's still got his angels at work, severing the just from the unjust. That's going to be the work of the angels. Have you served God? Have you done what was right? Have you obeyed God's word? You come this way. Have you not served God? Have you disobeyed him? Have you ignored his message in his Bible? You go that way, I'm afraid. God has no interest in you. You're not going to be part of the kingdom. Sorry about that, but that's it for you. Now, you, come on into the kingdom. The angels are going to be involved in that work. Serious stuff. Back in Luke, chapter 15. Um, and this is around baptism and repentance. And I mean, you've probably all witnessed or been to a baptism, I would think, at some point in your lives. Luke 15, uh, this is often quoted. Uh, verse 10. So, and it's absolutely so right, isn't it? Verse 10, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Isn't that amazing? So when you or I repent and say, I'm sorry, I got this wrong. I confess my sins to God. And I want to turn my life around. Now, particularly that's at baptism, but actually at any point, there is rejoicing in heaven that a sinner has said, I've got it wrong. God has got it right. I need to turn around and serve God. And there is rejoicing, there is joy in heaven. Can you imagine, you know, because God does rejoice, and the angels rejoice when someone acknowledges that God is right. You know, sometimes we go on through life and thinking, no, I want to do what I want to do. I'm right. I don't have to do what God tells me. But there's so much joy when you say, actually, I'm wrong. There is only one right way, and that's, that's God's way. That's the Bible's way. And there's rejoicing in heaven <laughs> with the angels. Uh, Luke chapter 20, verse 16. I've tried to pick these mostly from Luke so we can stay in one gospel record, but actually they're all over the gospels if you want to do your own study on angels. Uh, Luke 20 and verse 16. Actually, I'm not sure if that's right, is it? Let's just have a look. Luke 20. Do, 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 do. Let's just have a quick look. Right, we'll come back to that one. Um, just come over to Luke 22, verse 43. So this is Jesus now in the Garden of Gethsemane. He is praying to his Father, this agonizing prayer. And it's all about whether he's going to do his own will or whether he's going to do God's will. Because Jesus could have done his own will, couldn't he? But look at the mercy of God. Verse 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me, Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, Jesus says. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. So God sent an angel to Jesus to strengthen him in his hour of need. And verse, uh, sorry, chapter 24 of Luke, verse 23. So this now is at Jesus' resurrection. So just before his death, and we know when he was on the cross, he could have called for 12 legions of angels. That's about 72,000 angels Jesus could have called upon. Now verse 23 of Luke 24, When they found not his body, they came, saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, which said he was alive. 
you remember? When the women got to that rolled away stone, there was an angel. Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is risen. That was an angel. Okay, they're all through the life of Jesus. And indeed, two Thessalonians, please. Chapter 1. And they're going to be with him at his coming as well. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7. And to you who are troubled, he says, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Now, note Katie's point earlier. Look at verse 8. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. So Jesus is coming back with the angels and it's described there, picking absolutely, Psalm 104, verse 4, ministering spirits, flaming fire. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them. They're coming back, my dear young people, to judge. To judge the world with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the saints will be gathered at that time as well to Jesus Christ to help in the restoration of the earth. So I hope we've seen today that the angels are very much involved in God's purpose right throughout Scripture again. And that a correct understanding of the angels helps us understand the first principles of Scripture. We looked at two particular areas, but we could look, you know, much more. We just sampled that they're involved, haven't we? Um, with judgment, with resurrection, with the birth of Jesus, um, with supporting Jesus, with Jesus' return, with the promises, and actually we could prove that they delivered the law as well. We're not going to go there at the moment. But I hope we're starting to get a feel that, wow, the angels seem to be involved in everything. True, they are. And it's just helpful to understand that when we read the Scriptures. Okay, thanks for listening. Thanks for your input.